Hello, I'm Tim and I have too many books. This is my first booktube video and what you're supposed to do with your first booktube video is to do what's known as a booktube newbie tag. Now I've tried that several times I have to say and um, it never ends well. The questions or prompts in the newbie tag read to me a little bit like a, an internet dating profile and I'm terrible at those sort of things and when you end up with a question like what would you ask your favourite booktuber and instead of saying how do you get to be so wonderful you say why didn't you google that maybe that gives people the wrong impression so a while back i went off on a book buying expedition came back with a rather hefty book haul and realized that it shows you what kind of uh, booktuber i might be better than doing the newbie tag essentially what i do is collect books and I collect various authors. Now, I'd like to think that I only collect about 20 authors, but in fact, uh, it's more like 50, which is an awful lot. But I do try to collect the, all the books of certain people, as well as reading and have, buying one or two more contemporary books. So we'll start with the first book in the hall, which is uh, Frederica by Georgette Heyer. Uh, Georgette Heyer is the pioneer of uh, Regency romance fiction. This is one of her Re Regency romance books. The latter half of her life was spent writing Regency romances primarily. In the earlier part of her career she would write uh, novels from other historical periods, mostly Georgian, but always having a romantic story. She was a writer of the middle of the 20th century and like a lot of British writers of the middle of the 20th century she also wrote detective novels because it was the golden age of detective novels in Britain at the time. Uh, she was pretty good at it, she wrote about 10. Uh, a lot of the plots were worked out with the help of her husband who was a barrister uh, and she would flesh them out and write you know entertaining stories and she could confound with the best of them it, but it wasn't something that particularly interested her, she much preferred her historical novels, she had a very very good sense of history and her historical detail is often praised. One unfortunate thing about Georgette Hare that you might hear is that in her private life she was anti-Semitic. Again, this is not uncommon for people who were in the middle of the 20th century, but when you look at her books, there aren't not a lot of Jewish characters, but everyone mentions one particular book, which is The Grand Sophie, uh, which has a Jewish moneylender in it, and it's a particularly nasty caricature and stereotype of it. Now there are on the shelf above me there are 50 Georgette Hare books and The Grand Sophie is the only one people ever mention but I do understand how upsetting it can be when an author you like uh, tends to have views that you can't stand. Now the next book on the pile is this one Venusburg by Anthony Pohl. It's spelt Powell pronounced Pohl. Uh, this is his first novel. Now Anthony Pohl is best known for his 12 book sequence The Dance of the Music of Time which is sort of disguised biography of Anthony Pohl, his life from the 1920s up until the 1970s, a, a posh rather literary set um, all English. The Dance of the Music of Time doesn't sound too attractive from that point of view but is actually like its hero rather affable and it's nice to spend time with which is something that's great about uh, the dance of the music of time i don't know anything about this this novel i have to say but i am looking forward to reading it at some point now whenever anthony pole on the dance the music of time is mentioned what you'll often people will often also mention um simon raven he also wrote a number of um book cycles, his main, most famous book cycle is called Arms for Oblivion, that's Arms for Oblivion rather than Arms for Oblivion, which takes place over a similar amount of time which is more slightly more academic uh, and military than um, Anthony Pohl's work. It's also a lot more scabrous, a lot more satirical than uh, Anthony Pohl's work. Simon Raven is also the person who adapted the Palliser novels, Anthony Trollope's Palliser novels for the BBC back in the 1970s, which is a very long running, very popular series at the time. Before Cockcrow is his third book from his Firstborn of Egypt sequence of books, which he wrote after the Arms for Oblivion. And as the title, as the title of the sequence might suggest, he goes through the Firstborn of Egypt, knocking off characters from Arms for Oblivion in particularly nasty and uh, 
humorous ways. Right. The next book is um, Where in the World by V.S. Naipaul. I felt a little bit guilty when I started collecting V.S. Naipaul because I never, it took me a very long time to get around to reading him and I always felt that I collected him for the wrong reason. Uh, I felt that I needed to read more people, um, non-white authors, non-British and non-white authors, and I'd read Salman Rushdie and Arundhati Roy and Vikram Seth, and I thought, oh, I need another Indian author. And uh, I sort of had heard of V.S. Naipaul. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was often in the Booker Conversations. So I thought, oh, well, I'll start picking up his books. And I collected quite a lot of them before I actually started reading them. Fortunately, they're very good reads and they're a lot of fun. There's a great story about V.S. Naipaul's most famous book, The House for Mr. Biswas. Uh, which is the next V.S. Naipaul book I'm going to read. In the early 1960s, a composer called Monty Norman wanted to turn House of Mr. Biswas into a musical, and nothing really came of it apart from one of the songs, which was originally a song about Mr. Biswas bewailing his nose. I can't remember, I haven't read the book yet, so I can't remember if it's he, he sneezes too much or his nose is huge. One of those two. Yeah, anyway, like I said, the musical didn't come to anything, but the song persisted because one of Monty Norman's next gigs was to write the theme music to James Bond and his song about Mr. Biswas bewailing his nose becomes the theme song for the James Bond series, which is great fun. Love that story. The next book we have here is Joseph Heller's Now and Then. This is a memoir. I think this is his second part of his memoir. Joseph Heller, of course, is most famous for his books of uh, Catch-22 and things like Closing Time, which are the two books of his I've read so far. From the picture in here, he is wearing his uh, US Army Air Force uniform. Uh, he was a navigator or a bomb bombardier in the US Army Air Force, uh, set, uh, stationed mostly in Sardinia and later in Italy. And that is, of course, the location of Catch-22. So hopefully we're going to get a little bit of insight in this book into what inspired Catch-22, which will be very interesting once I eventually get around to reading it. Next book, Shell, Shell Game by Sarah Paretsky. Uh, in the, back in the 80s, uh, when they were first coming out, I used to devour Sarah Paretsky's V.I. Wachowski novels. She's written about 20 of these novels over the years. Um, V.I. Wachowski is such a great character, very um, strong very f feminist character of the 80s and I found them immensely entertaining. They did kind of fall off after about seven or eight of the books but I've got recently got back into them uh, and I'm going to be reading more of them very soon and I really enjoy her books. They did make a film of V.R. Wish Wachowski based on a couple of the early books. Uh, it stars Kathleen Turner. Now she was a very good choice for V.R. Wachowski but the the films really didn't portray Vera Wachowski very well. Uh, Vera Wachowski's you know, very independent. She's very physically brave. She's somebody who doesn't shy away from a fight. She's not somebody who goes in, you know, do doing the chop socky, but she's not afraid of, you know, taking a punch or two on, and giving back as, as good, you know, and giving back to a certain extent. Uh, she's also likes to look smart, but doesn't overdress. She enjoys men and having sex but she's not somebody who is you know desperate for the love the, the love of a man she's also not particularly maternal she's she doesn't feel that that's really what she wants to do with life although she's you know perfectly willing to get on with nieces and nephews and things like that that's kind of, I'm mentioning that because kind of yeah, they broke all those rules in the film, and that was a pity because Kathleen Turner was a pretty good fit for um, V.R. Wachowski. Uh, Sarah Perewski's run into the same problem that a lot of writers who write long-running um, characters do, and that's how she's had to de-age V.R. Wachowski. Uh, when Sarah Perewski was first writing it the, uh, in the 1980s, um, V.R. Wachowski was the same age as Sarah Perewski in her mid-30s. Well, uh, Sarah Perewski's in her 70s now, and you can't really have such an active and physical um, detective still running around Chicago um, getting into scrapes when she's, you know, in her 70s. So she's had to de-age uh, over the years uh, more and more. But still, I'm looking forward to getting working my way through all these novels because I do think they're great and I'd hardly recommend them. You want a, you know, want a female detective. Vera Wachowski is your woman. We move on to uh, Julian Barnes. Again, another 
book, um, I kind of accidental collection. His books uh, have entertaining titles, books like Flaubert's Parrot, uh, History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters. But when I started reading them, they were very, very entertaining. And particularly like, I think my favourite of his so far is Talking It Over, which is a sort of three-way narrative between three different characters and their relationship between, between you know, and the relationship between them. Uh, this is his letters from London. So it's basically a, a whole load of letters about what he thinks about life, probably. Um, and it could be very, could be very interesting. Probably, probably will be the last um, Julian Barnes I read after I've read most of the novels. But still, I'm looking forward to that. We now have um, R.F. Delderfield, Come Home Charlie and Face Them. Now, I was first introduced to R.F. Delderfield in the 1970s. Uh, there was an adaptation of his book to serve them all my days and that was adapted by Andrew Davis who wrote the adaptation of Pride and Prejudice that you all like and uh, he writes tends to write kind of saga novels where you follow somebody through several decades of their life yeah good things bad things happen to them they tend to be fairly decent human beings in his stories now this one is slightly different because it's a thriller and it's about a young man who robs a bank. It was made into a television program at some point, but I don't know if you can get it. Um, but the young man robs, robs a bank and uh, gets into scrapes. So this is something I definitely want to read and definitely want to complete the set on his. I'm currently reading his sequence called A Horseman Riding By. Um, the next book on that is The Green Gauntlet. And then I'm going to be reading um, or rereading To Serve Them All My Days, which I read in, back in the 1970s, but read very, very quickly. The last book on this list is T.H. White's Darkness at Pemberley. T.H. Uh, White is most famous for his Arthurian novel sequence, um, The Once and Future King. Uh, best known book of those is probably The um, Sword in the Stone, which is made into a Disney movie. It's a slightly light version of the Arthurian legend, but of course, um, the whole Arthurian legend is pretty miserable once you get into it, but he deals with the, the light stuff with the sword and the stone, and as uh, but and also deals quite well with it getting darker and getting more upsetting and unpleasant, and all these people that you're supposed to like, you know, stop liking after a while. Um, Darkness at Pemberley is a T. H. White's detective novel. He was a novelist of the mid nineteenth, mid twentieth century, and therefore he wrote a detective novel. Um, it is the Pemberley of. Um, Jane Austen's book Pride and Prejudice, it features characters called Charles and Elizabeth Darcy uh, as major features within the book and there's always an Elizabeth Pemberley ever since the first one got there in 1813. That I'm told is pretty much the only uh, Pride and Prejudice reference in, in the book. Just using that reference is a bit of fun, there's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be a Pride and Prejudice retelling or anything like that, but I'm looking forward to it. It's Sounds very interesting, like T.H. White's um, work, and like a detect I like a detective novel, and I love Pride and Prejudice, so what's not to like? Have you read this? You should have.